thoroughbred trio of Mike Summerby, Francis Lee and Colin Bell were all recruited for Manchester City by the Mercer Allison partnership. Joe Mercer, the respected establishment figure, and the rebel Malcolm Allison, his hugely ambitious coach. City were in Division 2, and Summerby was one of their first signings. A versatile outside right who arrived from Swindon Town in August 1965. Later that season, with City top of the league, Allison finally secured Colin Bell's transfer from Bury. Well, I told you about this player, and, um, and, he, and he used to say to me, he used to always send me to, to look at the players, you know. And uh, I think he saw him play only about once. And I used to sit in the stand, at, and we didn't have enough money, you know, they wanted 40 odd thousand pounds for him. And we didn't have enough money at Manchester City. So I used to sit in the stand and uh, I used to watch the game and there would be five or six scouts this side and three or four managers this side, you know. And I used to say, he's hopeless on his left foot, you know. <laughs> he's not too good in the air. Look at his positional player. And I, I used to criticise him all the time, you know. <laughs> and, because, uh, you know, and I could imagine some of their reports, you know, going in, he's not very good on his left side, you know, and he's this, that and the other. And, uh, and I used to insult him and call him and say he couldn't do this and he couldn't do that, you know, until we had the money and then we went and bought him. And then Joe... And when we bought him, Joe was watching and he was sitting in the stand and I was, I was warned off the touchline at the time. I was sitting near Joe and he went to me, oh, the second game, I think, the first game. No, the second game it was. And he said to me, how did we pay £42,000 for that play? He said, he, he's hopeless, he said to me. <laughs> that hopeless 20-year-old helped City win the second division by five points. But a season of struggle followed back in Division 1, and in October 1967, City purchased the third piece of their magic jigsaw. Francis Lee was a bustling forward bought from Bolton for £60,000. The first match in which Lee, Bell and Summerby played together, City beat Wolves 2-0 and was soon attracting attention. You know, we do everything quick and simple and we're remarkably fit. We don't mind who comes and sees us training or who sees us playing. You know, we feel it's a simple game and we try to make it simple. City were third in the league when Spurs came to an icy main road in December and took a seventh-minute lead through Jimmy Greaves. City's response was so sure-footed, the newspapers later christened it the Ballet on Ice. Alpano. Doyle to Lee. Ooh, that ball ran away from him. Doyle, Coleman. Lee. Bell. Colin Bell, the scorer. Summerby to Young. Lead behind him now, Young. Oh, what a goal! He's no, hit the bar. Coleman up to Young. Up to Summerby. A great goal! A lovely goal by Summerby. on his feet, perfect balance, up to lead, great football, and he's in the first a goal, Coleman, three goals to one, 19 minutes gone, a superb bit of football by Manchester City. A young. City's top scorer. Here comes some of you. Mike, Mike. Screens of Mike, Mike. And Mike's got it himself. And a goal! It's hit the post, Young. It's hit the post again. 
Well, there are only two posts in the set of goal posts, and Manchester City hit them both. What was uh, impressive to me about that game was that Dixie Dean was there. And he said to me, and Joe, he said, that is one of the most brilliant sides I've ever seen. City led the championship going into the last Saturday. And while challengers Manchester United were losing at home to Sunderland, City faced a nail-biting finale at Newcastle. The four, Doyle. To Bell. In the Newcastle penalty area now. To Doyle. And there it is! There's the first goal! Mike Sullivan has scored! Now Sinclair. In position, and here comes Brian Robson. It's a goal! Brian Robson from Robson has scored. He's equalised for Newcastle. Brian Robson. Dangerous player. There's Colin Bell to Oaks. Trying a shot through. And there it is! There's the second one. It looks as if it was Neil Young. Number 10 for City. George Heslop using his weight. He really is big. And there is the equaliser from Jackie Sinclair. There is the equaliser from Jackie Sinclair. What a shot. Leslie again, backed up by Doyle. Some of the lying in the offside position. To Bell. Well cut in that. And this must be it. Lee. Look, they've been held there by Clark. Bell. What can he do? There's Lee! There's Lee! He's not offside! He's not offside! Lee has scored! Lee has scored the goal! This must surely be it! Brian Robson. He's got it, but... And he's crossed it! It's a great chance! And there is a goal! I'm sure they can hardly stand the tension, I know I can't. And there it is, Manchester City are the champions of the first division. They defeated Newcastle by four goals to three. It's a tremendous atmosphere. The crowd were, were both the Geordies and all the Manchester, and they were all singing and happy, you know, at the end of the game, people running on the pitch. But I think it was a great relief for all the players in the City side. It was the first and only major trophy any of them have ever, ever won. And they couldn't believe it. And that's why it was a great occasion. And I think that just whetted our appetite to get wired in and uh, win something else as well. The people I've spoken to over the years, I think there was 96,000 there. They've all said, oh, I was at that game, I was at that game. And there was only 40-odd thousand there. And uh, the thing I remember about is they were even sat over the wall on the, on the walk round. And they never encroached on the pitch. No fencing up, no nothing. 40-odd thousand goals going at both ends, a lot of excitement, and they all behaved themselves, and it was terrific. The new champions warmed up for the 1968-69 season with a Charity Shield demolition of West Bromwich Albion. Collard, two, Young Hartford. Now oh, Solidy, he's got Owen up there with him. Here's Owen, and a goal! One minute, Owen has scored. Oaks, beautiful ball to Bell, and Summerby moving around very intelligently. And a goal! A goal scored by Lovett. He's put through his own goal. Is it Bell or Lee going to take it? No, Lee to Bell, to Summerby, to Lee. Oh, what a goal! Love it, trying to send Priswicky away, is a chance. Yes, it must be, yes, he won. Priswicky has scored. Oh.
Owen. Oh, it's a goal! Yes! There's the goal definitely over the line. Yes, Owen has scored. Bell, Somerby on the right with Lee. Lee now to Doyle. A young, all the way to the scored. Oaks to Bell. In moves Summerby. Lee, six more. We really thought we were in for a tremendous season. But after we won that, we didn't win a game for about ten games. <laughs> But it was a hard season, that particular season, because with win the championship the year before, that particular season, every game was like a cup tie. All the teams that we played came out and wanted to beat us because we were league champions. And we didn't know what was happening until the season was halfway over. And it was a hard season. I, th I think we started off the season so well again in the charity show by give, uh, really thrashing West Brom at Main Road. Everybody just thought, oh, we'll go out and play them, you know, and just ca carry on from there. And we suddenly started to struggle. We were a bit overconfident. I thought that we, th we thought we were going to win every game by scoring a lot of goals, and we really we really weren't playing well. By the time the European Cup came round, and, and then the Turks, everybody expecting us to, to beat Fenerbahce, I think we were overconfident again. We finished up drawing with them at Main Road and getting beat over there. Failure to terrorise Europe, as Alison had promised, was accompanied by a slump in the league. City's cavalier football suddenly wasn't producing results and the champions ended the season in 13th place. The FA Cup offered the season's salvation and in a tight semi-final against Everton, City's football was at times inspired. Much to the delight of their coach. Young, about 20 yards in his own half, plays a ball up to Bell. Bell plays the ball fairly quickly up to Lee. Lee controls the ball, and you'll see Young coming to the pitcher now, overlapping. He's run about 60 yards before he hits this tremendous shot. Three minutes to go, no score. Young with the corner for City. And there goes Doyle Summerby there, and there's Booth, number five, and it's a goal. City have scored. Three minutes from the end. In the build-up to the 1969 FA Cup final, the trio of Lee, Bell and Summerby came under detailed scrutiny from both club and international manager. And if, you, if you look very closely at players uh, receiving the ball, in particular Summerby, who faces his own player to some great extent, in other words, faces his own goal to receive a pass from his own players. He receives the ball, he brings players to him, and in bringing players to him is able, able to use the ball accurately in, in supplying uh, players that are coming from, from the back. I, I believe that Summerby doing this in the England team was, was more than successful in this uh, business of showing himself to receive the ball from, from other players. He holds the ball whilst his players are reforming and taking up uh, more positive or more uh, attacking positions and he uses the ball accurately to them. Front runners, goal scorers, fellas that's making it positive. Fellows who, you know, who play where it really hurts, in the penalty box. Mike Summerby, a very brave player. Beginning of the season, he wasn't doing too well, but he, he was forgetting to do basics. Mike is one of the best players with his back to the game, and in turn, this is the most difficult thing, especially in modern football, where they're coming in hard and they're tackling through you. I think you'll see Mike Summerby at his best at Wembley. We will see Colin Bell, who is a very young player, a very young player that gets through a tremendous amount of work, who, who is more suited from coming from deep positions into forward attacking players than actually being a forward attacking player. Summerby. Doyle. Oakes. Oakes moving it forward. Oh, well, yeah, it's a good shot. That's the goal. Bell, well, I feel, you know, we haven't seen the best of Bell. Uh, he, he can be better than, he play, uh, than he's played for England. He's improving all the time. He's got fantastic energy and stamina. Bit casual at times, or he looks casual at times. He's going to be the best player the City's had since Peter Doherty. 
this, you, you will notice that Francis Lee, Francis Lee, also an attacking player who loves to get into goal-scoring positions, most certainly, if not goal-scoring positions, shooting positions. Francis Lee, well, Wembley seems to be his home ground. I say to him every time I see him play, uh, play for England, I say, do you think you can play, uh, arrange to play like that for me sometime? Mm. Well, perhaps he will on Saturday. Short steps. Since we fetched him inside the field, his short, sharp uh, bursts of speed seems to suit him better. And his secret is this acceleration that, he, that he's got over ten, uh, five yards to get into these situations. He explodes into these situations. City were favoured to win the final against relegation-doomed Leicester City. And Wembley was already familiar to Lee, Bell and Summerby, who'd all played there for England, as Sir Alf Ramsey rebuilt his 1966 World Cup winning team. Well, it's something I remember about three years ago, I came to watch Everton and Sheffield Wednesday, I was in Bolton then. I came with a friend and I said to him, uh, I give a year's wages to play in the cup finals, we haven't done the field today, and you know, it's come true. Now, do you feel differently before the cup final than you did before playing for England in the international? Just slightly bit more nervous, I think, you know, but I, I think it'd be all right once I come up the tunnel, you know, it'd yeah. be all right then, yeah. Well, let's have a whirl with Mike Summerday. Who's that? Mike, you're looking very serious. I'm just looking at the crowd, that's all. <laughs> hey, enjoying it? Yeah, very good, yeah. You've got a whole lot of supporters here. Yeah, tremendous. When we were coming up, you know, to the ground, there was, there seemed to, I don't know if there is, there seemed to be more in Manchester City, I suppose, than there was Leicester, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where you got the tickets from. Now, um... I asked Francis about how different it is playing here and playing for England. Do you find a difference on this occasion, this I do, yeah. tension, atmosphere? The atmosphere seems to be greater than when I play for England here, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, everybody aims to play in the cup final. It's just a great occasion. I mean, uh, I think the atmosphere is greater for a cup final. What about any nerves, any butterflies in the tummy? Have you got any? Not really, no. You know, I just want to get out there and play, you know. You know, get it over with. It's From now onwards is, is the worst time, is it? You're, you're well, here and... Not really, you know, they build up so much to the cup final. This is what makes it, you know, so nervous and things like that. But uh, once the game starts, I think they disappear then, you know, because that's what we're here for, to play football. Well, anyway, let's hope it's a great game for you. And as we let you go to the dressing room, we'll just have a quick word with Colin Bell, another man we've got to congratulate on getting in the England party, Thank you the much, South American Ken. tour. Now, Colin, how do you feel at this moment, an hour before the cup final starts? Very nervous, very nervous indeed. More nervous than normal, anyway. <laughs> Are you normally a nervous sort of player? I normally have butterflies before a normal league game, but I have more, more here than I'll ever have, I think. Now, could you, could you really put your um, uh, nerves into words? Have you got any pains or any quivering? No, just uh, more or less the stomach a bit tense at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Now, what are you going to do uh, to get rid of this before the final? Cause... Well, I don't think there's anything I can do to get rid of it before the final. After the first five, ten minutes, I suppose it'll have gone once they get into the game. To Young, now Summerby is sticking to the sticking to his spot on the wing. And Summerby, this could be a dangerous situation. Sensibly trying to hit it low into the box. Bell giving far too much room to Summerby. Bell. Coleman and Young is there again. This boy Young is always buzzing around in this box. Oh, what a put his captain in trouble then, and it's Lee now for Manchester City. Three ready by Sonnaby. Coleman! Oh, hit that one so hurriedly, he'll never forgive himself. Oh, but what a beautiful break that was by Manchester City. Great running by Summerby. Laid on that chance for Coleman. First time we've seen Summerby moving inside, not being on this right touch line. And Summerby moved inside. It's Woolett with him. Summerby back to Young. It's there! Scored by Young. Made by Summerby. 23 minutes gone. The credit for that was Summerby. Scoring young. And notice the persistence of number seven, Summerby. As he beat Woolett and then he pulls it back. And young again in that.
at perfect position and made no mistake with that shot. A brilliant goal after 23 minutes. Neil Young. Congratulations on that goal. You were looking a much more relieved man now. How yes, are you feeling? Well, well, much better after that. But mind you, uh, it was against Roma play, I thought. They had a couple of chances, could have gone in. But some of his playing magnificent, and I think he made the goal. And of course, Neil Young, when he puts it on his left foot, it's just his chance. Doyle always someone of City in space, and whoops, there's Young! And a corner! A football, this man Bell finds oceans of space, he finds space that doesn't even exist. To Lee! They'll never give up these Manchester City fellows, and Lee gets a corner. What a beautiful ball to cover. Lockett will begin in the middle. Gibson's there. Clark is there. Clark. Lockhead. It's the goal. Oh, yes. Andy Lockhead must be wondering now. Eight feet high. Eight yards wide. And how could I miss? to Coleman. Manchester got all five forwards up and in comes Bill! And that header was going like a bullet. What a goalkeeper Peter Shilton is. And what a header by Bell. Now Bell playing the one-two ball with Lee. And look at this determination of Lee. Back to Summerby. Ross getting it away, but there's always a Manchester player there. It's always murderous pressure. Young and a great tackle by Ron Williams. Well, some of it being very brave, rolling his stockings down, discarding shin pads. He might never have worn them, but I'd hit to play with bare shins. As Lee, Lee with a chance for City, is the side getting. The FA Cup was only the second of four major trophies that City captain Tony Book would lift in the space of three seasons. Actually, it was, a, it was an amazing thing because Tony Coleman had that... Uh, he came to me about... After the semi-final, he said to me, I've got these two tattoos on my hands, Malcolm. And I said, yeah? He said, yeah. He said, I can't shake hands with royalty with tattoos on my hands. I said, all right, I'll send you to Christie Hospital. So I sent him to Christie Hospital, got that tattoos taken off. So he's coming the next day, he's got his hands bandaged up, you know. I said, you all right? He said, yeah. He said, very painful. I said, that would be all right. I said, you, the pain will go away two or three days, and, you know, you just have two white marks there, like two pennies. So he said, OK. So anyway, we go to the cup final, and Princess Anne's a guest of honour. So she comes out, meets Tony Book, Tony Book says, pleased to meet you. She meets Joe, Joe says, this is Captain Tony Book. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. How are you? This is uh, Glimpardo. How do you do? And he goes along the line, and Tony's standing number 11 at the end of the line. And he can't think of anything to say. He, he, he said, I've had these tattoos taken off, and I've got to say, I can't just say, pleased to meet you, ma'am, how do you do, ma'am? And she comes to Summerby, and Summerby said, hello, darling, what are you doing tonight? You know, and the lads had a little smile. And then they go to, to uh, seven, eight, they go to Belly, and then they go to Francis Lee. And then it's, uh, Tony Coleman still can't think of anything to say. You know, his mind's blocked. And it comes to Neil Young, and Neil Young's number 10, and she went, how do you do, and pleased to meet you, ma'am. Comes to Tony Coleman, he went, pleased to meet you, ma'am, give my love to your mum and dad. <laughs> <laughs> and that night, the Queen sent him a telegram, thanking him for his good really? wishes. Yeah, yeah. We went out believing that we could beat anybody. Doesn't matter who we turned out against. The team talks were very, very limited. It was just a couple of free kicks and get out and play. You bet on the side you're playing, score more goals than them. And that was it. I mean, so the, the team talks were a waste of time, really, on a Friday. They only lasted about two minutes. It was the same every... Every Friday, you're a good side, get out and play. No, the only part of the team talk, really, was when Harry was in goal. Harry Dow, wasn't it? We used to have a team talk in London, and Joe Mercer used to, Malcolm Harrison, Joe Mercer's talking, he used to say, Harry, 
because he wasn't the slightest bit interested in football. He was rather doing plumbing than being footballer. He said, Harry, we're playing Arsenal today, and they're in red and white. <laughs> On the international front, Lee and Bell now held regular places in the England team being prepared for the 1970 World Cup. That's one man they must try and contain, Lee. He scored! Oh, and the Irish were very slack about that one. And Francis Lee was able to get the whole lot of them. So it's going to be a penalty. Astor discussing life with Bobby Charlton and Colin Bell. And of course, England's penalty taker, Jeff Hurst, is not in the side this time. So it's going to be Francis Lee. England nil. Wales won. Bell. Lee. And poor Francis Lee. It's first penalty for England. And he's failed to equalise. Lee. Charlton to Lee. Charlton. That's it. Beautifully set up. And that really is one for the Wembley scrapbook. Bell. Charlton. out of position, Astor cleared up the line by Ron Reeves and finally Lee Spell Lee and it's a goal no yes it is a goal, the referee seemed to win his hands as if he wasn't going to give it but he's given it A Peters. And we've got three men in the middle. And a great chance, a goal scored by Bell. He scored it, a dreadful mistake by that Brazilian defence, and Bell has scored for England. Off the field, Francis Lee had been busy developing business interests that would later make him a millionaire. Still only 25, he shrewdly forecast football's future. The greatest thing for the game, I think, was when the maximum wage was abolished. Uh, Chaps became more dedicated to it. They thought, well, I can earn a lot of money at it, probably as much as I could in all my working life in another, in another job. So it's worth dedicating yourself to. And uh, I think this is why English football, especially in Europe, has come on so much. I think football will, will get bigger and bigger in this country. I think you'll see the times, uh, probably not in my career, but in another 10 years where you, your football stars will be like the golfers and the tennis players. They'll, they will earn fantastic amounts of money from outside the game. And, Things like this. If, if, if you say that uh, Tom Jones is on at Palladium and he gets £5,000 for one night's appearance and a footballer is playing in front of uh, a sellout for 60,000 and he's providing entertainment for 60,000 people and uh, he's getting paid, so we'll say, for a, a figure of £100 a week, I, don't, I, I think it's cheap. It's the cheapest form of entertainment going. Despite Charity Shield defeat at Leeds, the City Stars continued to provide that cheap entertainment next season both at club and international level. What a shot by Francis Lee. That was big, made him into a world-class player. That is a free kick on some of his head, and it's Bell. Oh, and it's, a, it's a goal. Bell's got a goal. Well, with commentary, all waiting and wondering what it was all about. There's the first goal of the match. Francis Lee coming through, through strong for Colin Bell, appealing for offside, but Bell gets it. Bell's got it. A lovely ball from Lee. Hurst. England have got three men in the 18-yard area. Bit of pushing and shoving going to Bell with a header. Up the cross bar. Mattering moving forward square off Charlton. England four being held up up front. Charlton on the return. Couldn't get out of it. Bell coming in. And goal! By Colin Bell. Out of nothing. Now Young, this is better from Young. Summerby! And a goal by Mike Summerby! Oops. 
Well played by Tommy Doyle. Lee getting an awful lot of room. City had already beaten great rivals Manchester United 4-0 in the league when they met in the semi-final of the League Cup. City winning over two legs with a 2-2 draw at Old Trafford in which Ian Bowyer scored after 17 minutes and a goalkeeper mistakenly dived to save an indirect free kick. Now Francis Lee had better get that leg right because this is a tailor-made position for him. Oh, it's an indirect free kick, so it'll have to be teed up. Obstruction. Oh, no, he's not going to have a shot at goal. Oh, it's a goal by Summerby. Stepney's touch meant Summerby had scored. Jeff Astle was that season's top first division goal scorer, and his header put City a goal down in the League Cup final against West Brom. The Wembley pitch had been all but destroyed by the Royal International Horse Show some months earlier, and conditions underfoot didn't suit City's normal passing game. Colin Suggard might have wrapped it all up for Albion, but he didn't, and City popped in the equaliser through the tireless Mike Doyle. Left-back Glyn Pardo, wearing 11 but playing in midfield, hooked in the winner, and City had now won the League Cup, the FA Cup and the Championship in successive seasons. Francis Lee was acclaimed the star. But that's one of the finest games he's ever played. I mean, he, he, I mean Malcolm will reiterate what I say, and most of the lads, that was the best game I've, he's ever played. As of, I think I've ever seen him play and been involved with him. He was outstanding that day. City was still chasing another trophy in the European Cup Winners' Cup, but began the home leg of the semi-final against Schalke a goal down. Francis Lee, Oates diagonally forward to his left, and he finds him. Mistake by Fickle, this is Doyle! And just the start that City wanted. Colin Bell. Noisman coming across, that's a good ball, picked up by Oakes. Young! Two up for City. Bell finding Oakes again, always coming forward, Alan Oakes. This is Young! Oh, what a left foot! Five minutes of the second half gone, City three up, 3-1 on aggregate. This is Doyle, Lee to his left, and Lee going straight in. Enigma for sure, never saw that. Pardo to Young. Bell, and the flick was just enough. The goalkeeper flat-footed. Van Haren coming in. Borschmidt there. Erlhoff, in comes the Buda. Just consolation, but it doesn't matter much. Really outplayed them in every department. And I remember the coach, he was a leading German coach, he was Elmut Schoen's assistant, I think, saying it was one of the finest performances he'd ever seen by a British club. So then we went on to the uh, final of the European Cup Winners' Cup in Vienna, where we beat Gornick 2-1. Paul Schiller, the Austrian referee, leads out the two teams for this Cup Winners' Cup final. On the right, Tony Book of Manchester City. On the left, Oslislo, the skipper of Gornick. And in fourth place there, just going through, was Lubanski, a man that Manchester City are going to have to give a very careful eye on. Already he's scored seven goals in the competition. Some 4,000 City uh, supporters in the ground, but the Prada Stadium really pretty empty. City without Mike Summerby, Gornick at full strength, and in that lineup, no less than 190 caps. Tony Book, Lee on the near post, Young on the far, Lee. What a player, and what a good reflex save by Koska. Pardo, Oaks inside him, Lee further down the touchline. Oleg, as ever, with him. Lee trying to tee himself up. Good save by Koska, Young! Neil Young, his fourth goal in the competition, but made by Francis Lee without a doubt. Just look how Francis Lee works himself into the right position. Beats Oleg. The goalkeeper, in fact, does well to get down by the near post. 
and Neil Young is the Johnny on the spot. This is Flensky. Not a very good ball towards Lislo. Young is clear. Costa coming out. Penalty, it must be. Schiller coming up, the referee, and it is. Points to the spot. Surely no doubt in his mind at all. If we look at it again, you can see a clear body check by the goalkeeper on Neil Young. Francis Lee to take the penalty with a good uh, fast bowler's run up. The rain absolutely teeming down. It was a bit lucky the power took it through the legs. And no cover at all in this part of the stadium, not even for the press. Oleg. Chased by Bowyer there. Bell must be a foul. Obstruction. Free kick somewhat, 15 yards from the 18-yard uh, box. 11 there is Sharinsky. And Olek and Scholtershik on the ball. Scholtershik to take it. Lubanski, nice play by him. As this low! 2-1. The Gornick skipper has scored. Lee towers inside him. Lee really very, very difficult to control. Olek has never really been near him. Oh, yeah! Well, the chance was clearly there to sew the whole thing up, but it went all wrong. And City hanging grimly now onto this lead at 2 1. Oleg again splashing through the puddles. The spectators really very wet, no cover at all in this Prada Stadium. Neil Young. One or two fans, I think, think that's the final whistle, but in fact, it's a free kick been given to Gornick. Neil Young backtracking. But it's a free kick that's never going to be taken. The cup winner's cup has gone to Main Road. City players now coming up to collect their award. Tony Book to collect the cup winner's cup from Hans Bangeter, the Secretary General of UFA. Rather large trophy. Escapado just to the left of Tony Book, to his left. And the rain's still teeming down, but it doesn't matter too much now. And the old man being lifted up again. It's becoming something of a habit. And that's what it's all about. The European Cup Winners' Cup, which will now join the League Cup on the shelf at Main Road. Light-hearted capers on the flight back home were mostly at the expense of manager Joe Mercer. There was the other one, actually, with, with, with Francis. We were sat at the back of the aircraft on the way back from this trip, and uh, he happened to notice the boss was sat on the outside aisle, and there was a vacant seat between, and there was a man sat in the corner who we didn't know. And we were on a chartered aircraft, so by the time you're going back, you know everybody. So we get, he calls the stewardess over a piece of paper and writes on it a little message, give it to Joe Mercer. So the boss looks at the paper and he says, the man in the corner is a suspected hijacker. Please keep him talking. Don't he kept panic. him talking for about four and a half hours this time, and he was a relief crew. <laughs> England's World Cup squad to Mexico in 1970 included both Colin Bell and Francis Lee. It's Cooper. First real chasing is given him, and it paid off. And Lee. That was real football by England. All created by Cooper and Lee so close. Lee, good flick. Now Charlton. This hurts to Lee. A ball. And England winning applause from this crowd. Right. Lee. And England really are controlling this. Charlton. To Mullery. That's right. Well, he followed through 
through, but he had to go for that. It was a 50-50 ball. The, the team that went to Mexico, I, th I thought was just slightly better than the team that won it in 66, and that's not taking any away from the lads who won it in 66, but uh, we were unfortunate not to win the, cup, the World Cup in Mexico. Right. What Things went? Just, just didn't run our way. In the game against Germany in the, in the quarter-final, we made three defensive mistakes, whereas England in the two World Cups together had never made three defensive mistakes, and it cost us the match. Colin Bell vented his World Cup disappointment with some classic goals over the next few seasons. He'd been the quarter-final sub who'd replaced Bobby Charlton. Pardo. This is Alan Oakes. 20 minutes gone, and it's... Colin... What a goal! What a goal! What a fantastic shot by Colin Bell! There's Doyle! in a neutral country was needed when City met old rivals Gornick in the quarter-finals of the 1970-71 Cup Winners' Cup. The ever-dependable Neil Young shooting City ahead in Copenhagen after 20 minutes. Then centre-half Tommy Booth glancing in goal number two shortly before half-time. Although Gornick pulled the goal back in the second half through Lubanski, City finally won 3 1. It was Colin Bell's individual skills that set up City's third goal for Francis Lee. But sadly, injury was to force Bell to miss both legs of the semi final against Chelsea. A much depleted City lost both those games 1-0. Francis Lee's 20th England cap was won in a European Championship match against Malta at Wembley in 1971. Martin Peters and the other 1966 veterans like Bobby Moore and goalkeeper Gordon Banks now playing with new boys like Ralph Coates, Roy McFarland and Martin Chivers. Lee's goal, one of England's five, was his ninth in international football. And in November, Summerby scored a collector's item against Switzerland. His one and only England goal. The 71-72 season again didn't produce a trophy for City. Still Summerby, though. But a record 15 penalties. Good down, is he? Y yes. All scored by Francis Lee. Lee against Bolton. A mistake at all by like that. Lee loves to take them like that, hitting them hard and true, right in the roof of the net. Lee scored 35 goals in all that season. Now Lee. Oh yes. Francis Lee straight through that wall of players. And even found time for pantomime. Two of the funniest England footballers I've ever seen. Uh, which one's which here? Well, I'm Francis Lee. I'm Mike Smithy. Mike. 
Yeah. You've been accused of being a bit of a diver and an actor on the field. Are you a good actor on the stage? I think I'm copying off Franny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a better penalty taker than you, sir. You never ever be educated, lad. By March 1972, Allison was now called team manager, Mercer still manager. City were top of the first division, only a handful of games left when they signed a talented yet impulsive individual. Instead of securing another championship, though, City won only four of the last nine games. And even though they beat Derby at Main Road, they couldn't prevent Brian Clough's team from snatching the title. In retrospect, the reason, to some, seems clear. I think we were six points clear at one stage. And then um, we had, we had Wynn Davis was with us then, who was tremendous centre forward for us, tremendous in the air, you know, especially with the crosses that used to come in. And with Francis feeding off him, Franny was getting goals every Saturday. He, he, he could score goals without a big fella, but this fella was a great foil for him. He used to cause so many problems. And then suddenly, Malcolm decided to buy Rodney. Now, we're all good fans of Rodney Marsh, and we're all great friends, but Rodney, at that time, wasn't the player for us, because it all stopped. We were a quick attacking side that got down the line quickly or got through the middle quickly and had shots. And suddenly, I mean, he started to stop playing because he was making his 40, 50-yard runs, and it was being stopped, you see. And that's when it started to go wrong. And if, uh, it's my own personal opinion, and, and I'm, I've got nothing against Rodney's ability as a player, because he was a great player. But that particular time for us, he wasn't the right player. It was six points clear. If we'd have continued with the, with the formation we played, we'd have gone ahead and won that championship that year. With that. I don't have any shadow of a doubt about that. We, we, we could have picked up the championship that year, because I remember about eight games to go. The last eight games, I don't think we won a game. In May, Mike Summerby enjoyed perhaps the best of his eight appearances for England. Summerby. And England really on a hatful. Summerby. Here's Bell. But while England prospered, there was to be a sad departure from City for Joe Mercer. The manager who'd consoled and counselled his players like a father figure was demoted when Allison was given control of all team affairs. Three days later, Mercer left to join Coventry. The great thing about Joe was that um, he'd come in on Tuesday or Wednesday, he'd play golf Monday or Tuesday, and he'd come in and he'd say to me, have you done this? I'd say, yeah. Have you done that? I'd say, yeah. He'd say, have you done that? I'd say, yes. Have you done this? I'd say, yeah. He said, what about so-and-so? And he'd come out with these little things, you know, just a little thing, and say, and I'd say, no, I've not done that. And that's where we were a good team, because, you know, he had, he had this the thing, just bringing up odd things and saying, you know, and that, those little tiny things make the team. I think it was a perfect combination, combination because Malcolm was, was probably the best coach I've ever worked with in football. And he, he motivated the players and got them to play and practice with them and everything like that. But, and Joe was, was sort of the father figure. He, he was sort of pouring oil on troubled waters every time Malcolm stirred up the, the troubled waters, or caused the troubled waters. But I think they were a very good combination, you know. And Joe, at that time, Matt Buzz was the manager of Manchester City. Joe gave it a... a, a give Manchester City the same amount of dignity as Manchester United had got through Matt Busby, and I think it was a, a, a nice balance in hand. This continental style away strip didn't help City win a trophy in the 1972-73 season. They never climbed higher than eighth in the table, despite away wins at Everton, West Brom and here at Tottenham, where Francis Lee scored twice. The steadying hand that once had steered City to success was now harder to detect. Allison left for Crystal Palace before the end of the season. 
Johnny Hart was in charge when an old favourite returned to City on a free transfer from Manchester United. This is Oakes. All five forwards up. Number 10, Francis Lee. Aimed at Bell, who got their law! What a moment for Dennis Law. Opens the scoring on his second league debut for Manchester City. 13 years after he made his first. Birmingham defence have done well in the absence of John Roberts. England, too, looked to be headed for a perfect day when they warmed up for a vital World Cup qualifying game against Poland by knocking seven past a hapless Austria. But qualification for the 1974 World Cup in Germany wasn't a formality. Chivers, Peters, that could well be a pass for Hughes by Kasperjak. Lance Mikhevich. Bell! Tomaszewski wasn't the clown that some had said. England turning this group. Here's Shannon, three in the middle. Peters, Jimmers, yes, surely no blocks. Curry, Shannon, Bell, great stop. Well, I was choked. Normally, it, it, it league level, it would take me a couple of days to get over a defeat on Saturday, probably through to Tuesday, but that particular game against Poland took me three or four weeks to get out of my system. I was absolutely choked. It was my chance of a lifetime, four years to go to the World Cup every four years. That was the one I was going to go to and make my name with England, and I didn't get the opportunity when I was at the peak of my career. And to get, well, to lose out to Poland, that, that was it. it was, I was devastated. It took me, like I say, that length of time to get over that particular game. I was disappointed I didn't get picked in the squad when England got knocked out against Poland because I played against all the Polish players about five times from Gornik. And I thought, I nearly picked up the phone and rang Alfram and they said, look, don't, don't bother about picking me anymore. Just pick me to play against the Polish defenders because they were frightened. They were frightened both physically and ability-wise because we had some real hard games against them. And I think I could have just done the job that night. I nearly picked up the phone and I thought, oh, sorry. When you say nearly, how nearly? Nearly, nearly picked it up and rang him. He said, please pick me for this one game. Could, could you have done that? Would Alf have listened? I don't know. He might have said, bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> Ron Saunders had become City's third manager in a year when City met Coventry in a League Cup quarter-final replay. Alderson. Oh, he's done it well. And he's going to go. Lee trying to make it, just too crowded there, now Doyle, Law, and they're not in by some of it. Alderson, Hutchison coming up, Alderson there, it's got to be, and is! Now to stick more and more often, hardly surprisingly. Here's Lee, and he's made it. The long one down. Here's Marsh. Law. Bell. And he's been given. Slide hush. Play 
Towers. And driven home by Law. It's all over now. No question now as Lee takes Law for a ride of delight. And the hopes from Summerby, Manchester City without question, are in the semi final of the Football League Cup. City confidently disposed of Plymouth in the semi-final, but disappointingly lost at Wembley to a late Wolves goal from John Richards. Saunders had been sacked, Tony Book elevated to manager, when City played the last game of that season against relegation-threatened Manchester United. Law's back heel helped send United down, and he never kicked a ball in league football again. It was disappointing for, for, for United supporters that Dennis, who did give him a free transfer uh, to, scored uh, the goal, back heel the ball in to score the goal that sent them down. I remember I was running away from goal, trying to get a shot in, and I was being squeezed out, and I hit it back across the goal mouth and miss-hit it, really, and Dennis just talkingly back heeled it, and, and it went. <laughs> and I think I was the first one to him after he scored, and I put my arm around his shoulders, packed them across his face, and he was so sick that he scored a goal. Normally, everybody's elated, but he's absolutely cheesed off. Suddenly, after seven seasons of loyal service, Francis Lee was sold to Derby County. I think uh, the morale in the dressing room, when Francis left, started uh, to go down, I think. It wasn't the same after that. It just went downhill from Francis leaving. That it, it just all started to change as from then. It wasn't the same. What was it like to be on the terraces at Main Road during that period? Tremendous. You, you went to the game knowing you were going to enjoy it because City very rarely lost at home. Even if they did lose, they played with flair, they played with some imagination. And uh, you went along knowing it was going to be a good afternoon's entertainment, especially if we were playing United, because we usually beat them those days. For Derby's Bruce Rioch and manager Dave Mackay, Lee's acquisition for the 74-75 season was to prove inspired. Nish. Interesting. Very interesting. Oh, look at his face. Just look at his face. It was either Derby to win the league or City to win the league that year. I mean, so we were both in contention, and uh, we beat uh, City at Main Road 2-1, uh, and I got the winner. Mm -hmm. I think it, it was a tremendous goal for me to score, really, uh, because I proved my point that I don't think City should have sold me. I think they made a big mistake selling me, but, it, but that's life. If they hadn't sold you, do you think the championship would have ended up at Main Road that season rather than at I don't Derby County? Uh, uh, yeah, I do think it would have stayed at Main Road, because uh, uh, Derby won about eight games away from home that season, 89 games the previous season before I went there, they only won two. I remember the goal well. Not a lot about the game, but the goal, it absolutely flew in. And he was absolutely delighted, I think, because he'd oh, been yeah. transferred from Manchester City and he'd come back and score for Derby County. But the crowd didn't real, right, realise what happened, because the crowd all, all rose and cheered. <laughs> 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 they could see the blue shirt underneath his uh, white shirt. Bell responded to Lee's departure with his best ever season of 15 league goals. And away by Bell, and now it's Stewart. The others are arriving quickly. In fact, it's four against three. Here's Marsh. That's Goodell. Thank you very much, 4-1. Marsh. Bell. Now approaching 29, many felt Colin Bell was at his peak. He was rarely injured and over a four-year period played in 33 of England's 37 internationals. Bell, he was pulled a bit. Here's Shannon, they're queuing at the far post. Bell! To Bell. The most haunting memory for City fans that season was when Lee teed up Henry Newton to score the goal that kept new club Derby on course to win the championship. Lee now danced to another's tune. And a second of the old musketeers was about to be discarded. Well, really, it was, t it was time for me to go. And also, really, I was really at the end of my career. I mean, I was, I was about three years older than Franny, and I'm probably four years older than Colin. 
So really, they gave me a bit of a lifeline, Burnley, and Jimmy Allenson was great. But they were going to give me a free transfer, but then suddenly Peter Swell stepped in and said they wanted 15,000. So they didn't do bad. They got me for 35, and I gave them 10 years service, and they got another 15, you know. So they, met, they only spent 15,000 on me. And they gave me a lifeline. I went there and I played for, I don't know, 18 months, was it? Two years, I don't know. But Burnley were tremendous. Super club when Jim Anderson was there. Good lads, you know. Footballers are general all the way around are all the same. They all have a bit of fun and a laugh and a giggle. The same thing happened with me when I left, when I left City to go to Derby. They, they paid £60,000 for me. And when they sold me to Derby, they were haggling over 100000 Was it 110000 Anything like that. You give them eight years good service, you've made a forty thousand pound profit, and they're haggling with Derby over the fee. Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't even have a testimonial match anyway, which didn't matter. But it's a fact that, that you leave under a cloud like that. Instead of saying, "Well, that's the fee, you pay it," and it's all done and dusted. Yeah, I remember when you were talking about that the day when they, when Dave Mackay stepped in, because when he left, I hoped I hoped I could go immediately, because really they, they wanted to they wanted to sweep the dust away and wanted to get rid of us. You know, we, there was a regime there that didn't want to. The characters and the success, you know, they didn't want the successful players there anymore. They wanted to get them out the door and a fresh start. Well, it was all breaking up. I mean, say, I've got my centre forward gone one season. At the end of the season, I've got my gone. So that's both players either side of me gone and a big part of the club gone. So, uh, like I say, the family atmosphere and the team spirit was just starting to, to crumble. Tragically, Colin Bell's own career was about to crumble too. It was six weeks before Christmas 1975, City playing United in a League Cup tie. First free kick to be taken by Oakes. Joe Royal is up. So is Dave Watson. Bell. Blocked everywhere and put in by Stewart. It's got to go down as one of the fastest goals in the derby match. Doyle again. Royal. Nice header. Stewart, space on the right for Colin Bell. He fell over the ball. And Bell has remained down. Doesn't look too good with Colin Bell. Ken Barnes with his hand round the injured part. And certainly a great bit of incident at the start of this match. The first very good for City, the second very bad. I remember Dennis Stewart knocking me through in the inside right position and I had three options in, in mind what to do. The first I was going to have a shot, if the ball would sit right, I was going to have a shot from about 25, 30 yards. And I could see the defender, defender coming from my left. And I thought, well, I'll drag the ball inside of him and then go on for goal. Or I could even quicken up and go on for goal first thing. And the third option was to drag the ball inside. And it was Martin Buckner, as it happens. And I was weight-bearing on my right leg as I dragged the ball to let him go past its speed. And he caught my knee, bent the knee backwards, burst a couple of blood vessels, did the ligaments, did the cartilage. And... Uh, off I went after about 10 minutes, and I think that they won the game 4-0. There was a big improvement after I went off. And, uh, and that was the start of the end of my career, really. Do you, look, do you look back at that with any animosity? Not really, not really. People ask me if, if, if the tackle was done on purpose. I mean, to say, I don't believe it was. I don't think things like that should happen in the game of football, that people do things like that. So. No, it's, it's a man's game, you take your knocks. I've, I've only got to be thankful that was later 20s when I picked up the injury. If it had been 21 or 22, I'd have been well and truly upset, but you just accept the knocks. Yeah, but it was only when he was 28, though, and Colin, because of his fitness and uh, his ability, would have played till he was 35, 36. Mike and I couldn't play that long because of the, the way we played, but Colin could have played till he was 35, 36. I think he lost... Seven years, six, seven years of his I, career. I, I could have definitely played another four or five years. I mean, say I was a person that didn't put weight on and fitness was, was natural, so to play another four or five years wouldn't have been a problem. City went on to reach the League Cup final, where Peter Barnes scored after 11 minutes, with Newcastle equalising before half-time. But there was no Lee, Bell or Summerby, and although Stewart's overhead kick won the Cup for City, a golden age in the club's history had come to an end.
Back home in Manchester, Colin Bell was preparing to soldier on for a further three seasons, trying to overcome crippling injury and rescue the last precious years of a glittering career. Sadly, it was never going to be quite the same again. And what's done in time has seized the nail. It's become what, like, a hinge on it? It's become like a rusty joint, really. I mean, it's a... It's basically needed a lot of exercises over the, the time of being out, just to keep it going. that keeps me going is the more exercise it gets, uh, the closer I am to playing. I mean, say I get a lot of pain, I think, well, I get a lot of pain now when I've done exercises for possibly an hour or two hours, it'll get less and less and then it'll get better and better, get close to playing. There's a little bit of daylight, I can see a little bit of daylight now, and it keeps me going. I know I've got to go through pain to get the knee bent, because it hasn't been bent fully for two years now. So it's going to, I'm going to have to go through some kind of pain and a lot of exercises to get it back to where it was. And this is what I keep doing in the gym. I keep flogging myself to death, hoping that one, one minute it'll, it'll just release, and that'll be it. No physical effort was too much in the battle to prevent disappearing youth. And as Bell pounded the pavements, he could find comfort in the memory of 48 caps for England and nine international goals. He'd captain Berry at 19, and 14 seasons at Main Road brought first and second division championship winners' medals, both FA and League Cups, and the European Cup Winners' Cup. As a city reserve in 1977-78, he also won a Central League Championship medal. But it wasn't quite the final postscript to a brilliant career. I consider Colin Bell to be one of the greatest players of all time. And I consider him to be possibly the finest tuned athlete that football's ever seen. So when we talk about Colin Bell, we're talking about somebody very special. Our position is very precarious. Two years, it's a long time. But overruling everything is our concern and desire to get the lad playing back in the first division. And we will try everything that's possible to do that. Two years after the injury, on Boxing Day 1977, Colin Bell did return to the first division and played a further 16 league games that season, including this one against West Ham. That old number nine shirt, once worn by Leon Summerby, now belonged to Brian Kidd. The team had changed, but the pleasure of playing hadn't diminished. When I was playing, I could always tell the rest of the days of the week by a Saturday. By playing on a Saturday, I could tell it was a Monday or a Wednesday or whatever. But after no special day, uh, like a Saturday, I didn't know what day it was for two years. Now I'm starting to get my days right in the week. A big cloud's been lifted, you know, from him. He's just, he is really a different person. I didn't think he changed very much, but he is, you know, so much happier. Colin, what have you had to eat this morning? Some bacon sandwiches, Fred. You use your bacon sandwiches, eh? Yes. You love those, don't yeah. you? You know they're all bad for you, though, don't you? So you keep telling me. City nursed and nurtured Colin Bell through another 15 games the following season. Patched up and powdered, he played 10 times in the first division, appeared in FA and League Cup ties, and even scored a UEFA Cup goal. But he was now 33. The injury and two years' rehabilitation had taken their toll. As Bell tried to make his way in a new city side, how he must have yearned for the sunshine days of Lee and Summerby, Young and Coleman, Doyle and Oakes.
When the future looks uncertain, it's heartbreaking for management and chairman to accept that their once brightest star has gone out. If it comes to the fact that he's got to quit football, the decision will be taken between Colin and the club. If he's not going to come back, I'm sure he knows it. He'll know he's not going to come back. And we'll talk about it. And sadly as it may work out, if that situation arises, we'll have to accept it. There's one thing for sure. He's irreplaceable here. What a strange twist that as Colin Bell departed the stage in 1979, so Tony Book was relinquishing team control to the returning Malcolm Allison, the man who'd originally brought Lee, Bell and Summerby to Manchester City over a decade earlier. In his search for their equal, Allison would spend millions and fail. Really and truly, them three players, like uh, Summerby was the most consistent. He was week in and week out and week out. Francis was the best finisher and, and the most aware. And Colin Bell was the greatest athlete. They were phenomenal, them three players. I think Mike was a great guy to have in your team wherever you were playing, home or away in, in Europe, whether it was below freezing or you're playing in Italy and it was 80 degrees, 90 degrees, because he was always the first to get going in the game and, and re really attack and, and get at people, you know. There's an old saying about the when the going gets tough, the tough get going, but Mike used to start right from the word go, and you could always rely on him. You know, he got tremendous speed and a beautiful cross of the ball. Not the best finisher in the world, but, <laughs> but uh, a marvellous player to play with. Colin was a completely different player because he, Colin used to play and he made it so easy. You know, he, he, he was probably the most complete inside forward all round that you'd ever see. He got tremendous speed, good stamina, good in the air, tremendous shot and good skill as well. So he could really have played anywhere, Colin. Colin could have been a right full back, a centre half, a double centre half, midfield. Or you could even play him as a striker. Well, they're both great players. And I mean, they are very lucky that I play between them. And as Francis said before, I mean to say, when it gets hard going, you get people or players that tend to hide a little bit. But with Mike and Franny, I mean to say they were shown all the time, which made my game very easy. They always wanted the ball, always wanted to get me out of trouble, and to have one, one on the left and one on the right. Franny, I mean to say, was a typical centre forward, great finisher. Uh, I remember we played a game at Forest, I mean to say, he's one downfall was it's probably his heading ability, but he nodded two in it uh, at Forest in one game. He's run back and he was absolutely delighted to get two in one game. But I mean, see, he's finishing. And Mike, he's, he's speed. But I mean, say, they're two great players. They had everything, everything you wanted. Well, Francis, um, to me, has always been the most confident player I've ever come across. Confidence in his own ability. Um, a tremendous goal scorer. In, the, in a side, you always got to rely upon someone to win the game. You know, we were always we could always score goals, but if the situation arose, we were up against it. The quarter final at Main Road when we played Tottenham, and we were, it was an end-to-end -end game, a very tight situation. Tottenham had come to sort of close it up and everything like that. And I think there was about five or, t five or six minutes to go, and he, he got it out of nothing. He scored the goal out of nothing. He was a type of player that could go forward, have a go at people. And he was an aggressive type of person where we could all rely upon, you know, the first five minutes of any game, we always used to touch up these defenders, make sure to find out how hard they were, and he was one of these type of players. But a great player, a great England player as well. Confidence in his own ability, which is a tremendous thing. Colin Bell, there's not a lot really you can say about Colin Bell, because as Francis has said, he was, to me, the complete footballer. The only thing that sometimes worries me about him is that we never really saw the full extent of his ability. I mean, we used to come off the, come off the field at half-time, we slathered in sweat, and Colin used to come off with a blob because he used to play the game so easy, control the ball, any position, cover the ground, far better than anybody could ever think of. You talk about people getting into boxes today, he could be in the box, having a go at goal, back defending before we can say Jack Robinson. Amazing player, great player. Two great players, and people, when they talk about great players today, very rarely do you ever hear him say Francis Lee or Colin Bell, but let me tell you, to play with those, and, to, and you ask some defenders around the world and in the first division, and they tell about players like your Tommy Smith, you'll ask him, he'll tell you. Just looking back on that era at Manchester City, what would be your, what is your fondest memory? What comes to I, mind? I think, I think it was all a great me memory. It was a great time to be at Manchester City. We had so much fun, there were so many characters, we had so many laughs. It, you couldn't really, you couldn't buy that. 
it was absolutely a real marvellous part of my life. And I wouldn't change it for anything. Well, for me, it was just a pleasure to go in every morning because everything was so happy and people were so happy and, and everything was going well and success was there. It was terrific times. So happy. Uh, that was basically it, the happiness every day. Personally, for me, is actually being a part of, of the history of Manchester City because when I came there, the first thing that stuck at, looked for me was the actual ground. And I played at Swindon under a small ground. I came there and I thought, you know, the tradition of the club but also the opportunity to play with great players. I mean, great players and a great team and be managed by a person that's always been admired as a footballer and as a manager, Joe Mercer, and with Malcolm Allison, who, who really, you know, I was just an ordinary player and he gave me the, the ability and the, not the ability, he gave me the opportunity to go out there and play the way that I could play, gave me the confidence to play that way and also to play with people like Francis Lee and Colin Bell, who, you know, their record stands for itself. It was just a great period of my life and a life as they've all said before, that you can never get that back. We played football with a smile and enjoyed it.